Hello church family, this is Pastor Mitchell and welcome to another edition of our Wednesday Bible Study Experience. Uh, welcome in for those that are with us on YouTube uh, for our YouTube premiere. Go on and let us know in the comment section that you're here. For those that are a part of our Facebook watch party, let us know that you're here on Facebook. Let us know in the comment section for all those who are on our conference call line. It's good to have you on the call tonight. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for continuing to stay connected even in the midst of this time of pandemic and for committing not just to be with us in worship, not just for, for the giving of your tithes and your offering and your contributions to the work of the church, but also for committing to be in Bible study so that we are not just a worshiping community, but a, a community of God that grows in the word of God and in Christian education and Christian development. As you know, we have sort of shortened our Bible study experience to make it a little better for the virtual experience. Uh, it's a little different than being in. And so we would like to get right to the meat of the word, right to the meat of the message and the study. So I want you to do two things. I want you, if you've not already liked and subscribed to our YouTube page or liked and followed our Facebook page, I want you to do that now. Uh, I also want you to share. If you're on Facebook right now, share uh, the fact that you are on the watch party. Bring some folks, invite some folks in as we study in the word of God together tonight. Listen, we are continuing in our series. We had started a series. This is installment number three of our series entitled A Firm Foundation. And the idea of this series was to start our time together as pastor and people looking at some of the foundational building blocks of our faith that we want to be able to talk about the deep mysteries of God. But before we do that, we wanted to make sure that we were all on equal footing, that we started from a place of a firm foundation around who God is, what our theology about God is as Christians, as Baptist folks, and as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you were with us from the beginning of that series, you know that we began by looking at first things first. We started in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 through 6, and we talked about having a foundation in faith and a foundation in belief, first of all, that God exists. That comes from Hebrews 11 and 6. It said those that come to God must first believe that he exists or that God exists and that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek them. I, I am arguing um, through this series that before we can talk about scripture and before we can talk about Christ our Savior and the various things that happened in the church, you have to first believe that God exists. It's not until you believe that there is a God that you are able to dive into the scriptures about our God and learn about who God is and what God desires from us. So we began from Hebrews 11 and 6, talking about the importance of faith in our development with Christ, um, but also the primary belief that God exists and that God rewards those who seek after him. In our last session, that was called the Master's Manual. And we said that once you believe that God exists and that God will reward you for seeking out information on who God is and what God desires, that then how do we do that? Well, we've been given this manual through scripture and we talked about the importance of sacred scripture. We talked about the primacy or the primacy of sacred scripture. We talked about the purpose of sacred scripture. We talked about how sacred scripture was penned, how there was inspiration that led to transmission first orally and then through um, written inscription and ending in inscription. And we talked about the purpose of scripture and how that helps us to understand who God is and what God desires from us. So tonight, as we continue in our series on this firm foundation, we want to go to part three. Now that we have affirmed that God exists, now that we have affirmed that we have a way of knowing God, primarily through the scriptures that are written about God, my question for week three is what do the scriptures say about who God is? All right. We believe that God exists. We believe in scripture. But what does scripture tell us about who God is? And so tonight we're going to look really at the entirety of John chapter 14. That's our anchor section. We're going to read verse uh, 23 through 31 for our reading. But really the entirety of John chapter 14 is what I want you to study on your time when you leave this Bible study on your own personal time and devotion. That really sets the anchor text for this discussion. But before we jump in, of course, you know me, I have an icebreaker question. And our icebreaker question is this. Can you think of something that you use with regularity that has multiple functions or multiple uses? Can you think of something that you use with regularity that has multiple functions or multiple uses? One example that I wrote down is I have a pen that I love at the house and I utilize that pen as a pen on one side, but on the other side of that pen, if you bop 
uh, it becomes a flashlight. So it's a two in one. It is both a pen and it is a flashlight. Do you use some things? Do you know some things that you utilize with regularity that have multiple functions and multiple uses? I want you to write that down. If you're just coming in, welcome to our experience. We hope that you are are blessed by the word of God tonight. If you're on Facebook, let us know that you're here in our watch party and in the comment section. If you're on YouTube, let us know that you're here in the comment section. And I'll read our icebreaker question one more time. Can you think of something that you use with regularity that has multiple functions and uses? Um, can you think of something that you use with regularity that has multiple functions and uses? All right. Take some time to write that down and prepare your notes because we are not going to do an extensive Bible study today, but there are a lot of scriptures. There are a lot of concepts that I want to throw at you tonight that I want you to write down so that you can investigate on your own when time permits. All right. But tonight's lesson is part three of our series on a firm foundation. And that lesson is entitled the triune God, the triune God. That's what we're going to talk about. The triune God tonight and our anchor scripture again, John chapter 14, but we're going to be looking specifically at verses 23 through 31. Now, this term triune literally means consisting of three in one. Triune equals threefold. Sometimes when we talk about God, we use the word triune or some of you have heard this word, this word Trinity, this idea of us serving a God that shows up in three different ways. That's what I want to talk about tonight. And though this word Trinity is a theological concept and that actual word we never see appear in our text, the concept of the Trinity, the concept of a triune God is what is at the heart of John chapter 14 tonight. And like some of the things that we mentioned in our icebreaker, I want to make the argument tonight that we serve one God that functions in three unique ways. That's really all I want to talk about in the short time that we have tonight, and we'll build on it in later weeks. But I want to make the central argument tonight, one central claim that we serve a God who manifests, one God who manifests God's self and functions in at least three unique ways. Now, in the next three weeks or in the next few weeks, we'll do a deeper dive into each of the three persons of the Godhead. Uh, like we like to say in the church, and we'll do that individually. But this text and this lesson is really to just introduce and to start with, to introduce the topic of the triune God in this way. Um, because, and the reason we use this scripture in John 14, is because it is a unique scripture where Jesus speaks to each of the three parts of the Godhead and provides us with at least a teaser. It's not the entirety of what each piece of the Godhead does, but he provides at least a teaser of the role and the function of each of the persons of God represented in Scripture. And of course, in the later weeks, we're going to deep dive into them a little bit more. But I think this is a good introductory look at the triune God. Let's look at that. Let's read that text in John chapter 14, verse 23 through 31. It says, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And I will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say that I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it happens, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the price of this world, or the prince rather, this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. That's John chapter 14, verse 23 through 21, where Jesus lays out in Jesus' own words, these three functions, three persons, this triune God in John chapter 14, verse 23 through 21. And I think that as I want to teach this lesson, 
maybe the best way to teach this introductory look at the triune God is to say what is not meant by the words of Jesus or by this teacher tonight. That maybe the best way to introduce this is to go through what is not meant by the triune God as it relates to Jesus' statement in John chapter 14 and as it relates to your teacher. All right. So let's say this as we talk about this God and what scripture says about God. Let me say what is not what this lesson is not meant to do. Number one, it is not meant to minimize the mystery of God. That in 30 minutes, and our 30 minutes, or however long this session ends up being, we cannot get an exhaustive understanding of who God is. Nor through a lifelong set of teachings, there are people who have PhDs in Old Testament and New Testament studies, even with 40, 50 years of Old Testament, New Testament study, even with 80, 70, 90 years of Sunday school and Bible study, we cannot understand God and God's totality, that we don't have the capacity or the space or the time to truly understand who God is and then be able to articulate exactly who God is to others. I always leave room, and you'll hear me say this again, I always leave room for the mystery of God, that which is about God that does not appear on paper. I stand with the psalmist in Psalm 139 verse 6. He says this, such knowledge, talking about God, such knowledge of God is too wonderful me, too wonderful for me. It is too great for me to understand or to fully understand. And we have to understand as we begin this introduction of who God is, that ultimately God is to be revealed to us over time. God continues to reveal God's self to us. And in doing so, God cannot simply be researched and God cannot simply be reasoned. That as we talk about God, we have to understand that God is a mystery. We have to leave room for the mystery of God. And even as we have the scriptures, even as we have experience and reason, as we talked about in our last uh, piece and tradition that helps us to understand who God is, that we can't fully understand or explain who God is, not in this Bible study, not even in 60, 70, 80 years of our studies of the scripture, that there is still a mystery about God where we'll never fully be able to grasp God or understand God. All right. I also want to say that by talking about the triune God, that I am not intentionally playing into patriarchal structures or patriarchal norms. And that's important for me to say, because when we speak classically about this triune God, we normally speak about God in a paternal way, in a masculine way, or as some would say, even in a patriarchal way. We speak about God as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who I most often hear referred to as a he. And in a male-dominated patriarchal culture in which the Bible is written and presented to us, this can be expected that they would speak about God uh, in male terms, in masculine terms, and even in patriarchal terms. And as you will see in our anchor text, Jesus, or as we have recorded Jesus' words, Jesus speaks about God as Father, God as Father with regularity. And so for that reason, I'm okay with defaulting to speaking about God or understanding God as Father. Though I often will try to speak of God as God. When you hear me preaching and teaching, you will often hear me talk about God as God or say things like God's self. Because my attempt is to be as inclusive as I can um, as I do my teaching and my preaching about who God is. However, there are brothers and sisters who speak about God as mother, who speak about God as parent, who lean into some of the feminine attributes and characteristics of God. And as your pastor, I want to say that I don't have an issue with that. My, my normal default setting somewhere in Joshua's brain and theology is to call God Father, to sometimes utilize the pronoun he. That's how I came up, um, and that works for me. But I don't have an issue with others who speak about God in other ways, who speak about God as mother, who speak about God as parent, who, treat, who try not to speak about God as father in that way. And there are two guiding reasons for this assertion. Number one, while God is never explicitly referred to as mother, or as a woman anywhere in our text, there are instances where the feminine aspect of God are mentioned in the text. 
Most pointedly, there are comparisons between God and mother birds, particularly in the psalm. God will be compared to a mother bird or even Jesus compares God to a mother hen. But this mother bird who takes us under God's wings, right? We see this in the Psalms primarily. Psalm 17 verse 8. He says, keep me as the apple of your eye and hide me in the shadow of your wings. The implication is the shadow of your wings like a mother who hides her children, her children, a mother bird. We also see this in Psalm 57 verse 1. He says, I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings. There's that that simile and that analogy again, the shadow of your, of your wings until the disaster has passed. These are examples where God in the Old Testament is compared to a mother, a mother bird whose wings shelter and protect her young, right? But we also see Jesus making a simile between God and a mother hen. If you look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Jesus here compares God again to one, to a mother hen, a bird who is gathering her children under their wings, right? In the book of Hosea, we see that God compares God's self even to a mother bear. You look at Hosea chapter 13 and verse 8. He says, like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open, those who deal wrongly with God's children. So we see that there are these comparisons to God, to female birds, to female, um, uh, to female bears uh, in the text, or mother bears. But God is even compared to human mothers in our text. If you look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 13. This is what God says, as a mother comforts her child, so I comfort you and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. That is Isaiah chapter 66, verse 13. Isaiah 42, again, um, these passages in Isaiah, Isaiah 42, verse 14. For a long time, I, God, have kept silent. I have been silent and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and I pant, all right? We see a, 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 another depiction, this imagery of, uh, of, of femininity in God compared to a woman in motherhood. We see here in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the children she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. That is Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15. And so part of the reason I don't have issue when brothers and sisters choose uh, to lean into the feminine attributes of God, maybe even refer to God as mother or parent. I don't have issue number one because we do see images in the text where God is compared to women. God is compared to a mother. God is compared to some of the feminine qualities. But secondly, if we are truthful about who God is, the truth is that God is neither man nor woman. Huh? That, 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 let that sink in. If we really want to talk about the essence of who God is, God is neither male nor female. Ultimately, God is without gender because God is a spirit. And I have Bible for that. If you look at Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, explicitly says that God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. All right? That we see that God is, according to numbers, is not a male. God is not a man that he should lie. God is not the son of a man that he should have to repent. God is not human is what numbers is trying to communicate for us. And John clarifies for us exactly what God is and who God is. John says, though, though God is not man, God, John verse 4, 24, John chapter 4 verse 24 says that God is a spirit. They that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. And if we want to talk about the reality of God, I, I can't get into battles with people about God as he or God as she, because the truth is God is neither he nor she. God is spirit. In reality, we understand God as an infinite, holy and intelligent being, the maker and supreme ruler of heaven and earth who has no true gender, but is a spirit. 
Now, for our purposes, for human purposes, and because of the limitations of our understanding, we will continue to utilize the language of Jesus that we see in John chapter 14. Jesus refers to God as Father, God as Son, and God as Holy Spirit. But we do so acknowledging that we utilize humans, we utilize pronouns to help us in the limitations of our thoughts and of our language. But that does not limit who God truly is. Pronouns are powerful. Uh, pronouns can also prohibit. And so while I affirm the picture that Jesus utilizes in John chapter 14 of God as Father and have classically, this is your pastor talking, I've classically utilized pronouns like he to talk about who God is. I also acknowledge that given your personal history, where you sit in society and where you sit in the gender spectrum, gender spectrum and in reality where you have sat in your history with other models, right? Your father, your mother, that may influence how you understand God. And I'm okay with how you speak about God, given the, given the true reality that God is neither male nor female, but God is a spirit. And those that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. So number one, when we talk about God, we are not talking about God in a way that minimizes the mystery of, of God, right? That the psalmist suggests to us, we cannot tie down fully who God is. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I can't attain it. I leave room for the mystery of God, even in our teachings about God, that there is a mystery about God that we don't fully understand and we don't fully know. But I also say that even when we talk about God as Father, Son, and Spirit, we do so leaving room for those who also interpret God as mother, who interpret God as parent. And we leave room for those with, with the knowledge, not upholding patriarchal structures uh, or patriarchal norms in an oppressive way. But we do so with the understanding that Jesus utilizes this language in John 14 and with the understanding that in reality, God is spirit. Those that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. But finally, I also want to dispel this idea that we believe in a God, when we talk about a triune God, three in one, what I am not saying is that we believe in a God that or we worship um, in a polytheistic way, that we are not worshiping multiple gods. When we talk about God as father, God as son and God as spirit, what we are not saying is that we are a polytheistic religion, that we are serving and worshiping multiple gods. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, which Jesus would later quote in his ministry when he is approached about what the greatest commandment is. He reminds us of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 4, where Deuteronomy 6 and 4 says, Hear, O Israel, that the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. That scripture is in place to signify to the people of God that they ought to differentiate themselves from those who are worshiping pagan gods, those polytheistic religions that were um, being worshipped and that were being participated in among the people of Israel and their neighboring societies. And it was important for God to say, listen, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. We serve one God. We serve one God. And that makes us different from the cultures and the religions that were around them that worship multiple gods. So when we talk about a triune God, we are not saying that we worship three different gods, but rather one God that manifests God's self in three different ways. And classically, we have talked about these manifestations of God um, as God heads or God persons or persons of God. We talk about the God head and we talk about God, um, the persons of God, the person of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, that fame hymn of the church, holy, holy, holy. You hear these words, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. When we get to the end, he says, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. But for the unchurched, I think an illustration that might be helpful or words that might be helpful to help us understand that we uh, worship one God that has three different appearances or three different persons. One way to think about that or explain it is to emphasize two words that I'm going to use tonight. One is manifestation and the other is function. And so when we talk about this one God 
that has three persons. What I'm saying is that we are serving and worshiping a God who manifests God's self in three unique ways, according to scripture, based on the context that you experience God in. And depending on the context that you experience God in, you'll find God serving and manifesting in a way and functioning in a way. And according to this text, we can experience God manifested in three ways, in Father, Son, and in Holy Spirit. Let me say it again, that we are serving and worshiping one God who manifests God's self in three unique ways based on the context that we experience God in. Based on the context we are experiencing God, God will manifest God's self in one of three ways and God is operating in one of three functions. So according to the text for tonight, Jesus says that we see God, one is God Father, two God Son, three God Holy Spirit. When we see God Father, Jesus helps us to see that He that God the Father functions as the creative God. When, when we get to Genesis, and Genesis chapter 1 says, in the beginning, God, that, that's who Jesus is referring to when we talk about God the Father, the creator God. Um, and really, the way that Jesus talks about God in this text, God the Father functions as the control panel, right? Uh, and the one that Jesus desires us to see the most. That, that, that piece of that text where Jesus says that the Father is greater than I, the best way for me to understand that text is when, you know someone who says, uh, when they're taking a picture, now listen, I want you to get my good side. <laughs> that we, we affirm that it's all you, but there is a preferential side that you want people to see and put their attention on. That's what Jesus means when Jesus says, I'm going back to the Father because the Father is greater than I. That the Father God, the Father God is, is the side of God that is preferred. That, that, that preference for us to look to is that Father God. We see that in the text. And Jesus paints God as creator. Jesus paints God as the control panel, literally functioning in a way where God sends Jesus into the world. Jesus says, it is the Father that sent me. And Jesus says in John 14, that God sends the Holy Spirit that will come in Jesus' name. All right? So we see that God literally functions as control panel, God functions as creator, and we'll later talk about the ways that God the Father functions and shows up. God is, God the Father we know is omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. We affirm, we affirm that God is omniscient, meaning all-knowing, and we affirm that God the Father is omnipresent. God is in all places at all times, and we'll discuss that further in additional lessons. But we see one, Jesus shows us that the Father will show up and functions as creator, as control panel, and as that good side, that, that, that thing or that function or that manifestation of God that is preferential and who Jesus is pointing us to, right? But then Jesus is the second manifestation of God. And the text affirms that Jesus functions as the mirror and the mouthpiece for the Father. Look at John chapter 14, verse 16, verse 6 and through 14. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In that way, Jesus speaks of himself as a middleman. He says, if you really know me, you will know my God, my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father that we will be enough for us, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak out of my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say I am the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Verily, truly, I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. 
and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. What we see from the text is that Jesus is saying, if you want to see the Father, look at me. I am the mirror, the human in human form. I am the mirror of the value, the virtue, the way, and the power of Almighty God. So in one way, Jesus functions as a mirror for God. And when we, as believers, want to understand what living for God and what God's will and God's way is in human form, Jesus says, I'm the mirror that if you've seen me, you've seen God, right? He doesn't just function as and that he speaks on behalf of God. He said, I don't speak of my own authority. This is coming from God, right? It's the father living in me who is doing this work. Jesus functions, manifests as God and functions as the mouthpiece and the mirror for God. But in later weeks, we'll also talk about the way in which Jesus functions as our Messiah, the anointed one, the deliverer, according to scripture, that was prophesied, prophesied in scripture. And Jesus functions as our savior, as the savior of the world. And we'll take a deeper dive into the work and the worth of Christ in another session. So we see that God may manifest God's self as God the Father, manifest God's self as God the Son in Jesus Christ. Finally, Jesus says the Holy Spirit. He lifts the Holy Spirit. It's God manifesting as the Holy Spirit. And the function Jesus speaks to is in John chapter, four, John chapter 14, verse 26. He says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus said that there is a third person uh, in the Godhead, a third manifestation of God, and that is the Holy Spirit, which functions, according to Jesus in John 14, 26, as an advocate for us. We'll talk more about what that means. That the Holy Spirit is our teacher, right? Teaches us the ways of God, guides us, that the Holy Spirit provides reminders for us, will remind us. One scripture says the Holy Spirit brings back to our remembrance everything that we need, everything that we have learned. And that the Holy Spirit also functions. Uh, in other scriptures, we'll find that the Holy Spirit functions as our comforter and as our God. All right. And Jesus says all three of these manifestations are one. Jesus says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Now, the question around how these three persons could all be one has been debated for ages. How do you explain three unique manifestations of one God all together being the same? And my favorite answer for that comes from a resolution from a fourth century council called the Council of Nicaea. There were some brothers who got together, some scholars who got together, some church fathers who got together, and they debated several theological issues. And this group of scholars, when thinking through what Jesus means, when Jesus says um, in John chapter 10, verse 30, that I and the Father are one, what does he mean? And this is how they resolve this matter. And I want to share this with you tonight. They say they utilize a term, homoousion. Homo meaning same, usian meaning essence. That when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, Jesus is saying that Jesus, God, and by implication, God the Father rather, and by implication, the Holy Spirit are one and the same because they are made of the same essence. That Jesus, God the Father, and God the Spirit are one because they are made of the same stuff. Now, for those who are having trouble with this idea, uh, I want to offer two illustrations and then I'm going to leave it alone for tonight. And in subsequent weeks, we're going to do a deep dive into each person of the Godhead. Right. But give me let me give you two illustrations that I hope will be helpful for you as I close. Number one has to do with God being all the same based on function. And the second illustration is based on the same essence. Let me give you an illustration. Number one that revolves around function. I am Joshua Mitchell. I am one guy, I am one person. But depending on the context that you meet me in or where I show up to you, 
I am at the same time one person, but I function differently. And each function comes with a different name or a different title. So to Jordan, my son, I'm Dada. I'm his father. To Lori, I'm her husband. I'm Boo. To my mother and father, I'm Josh. I'm their son. To 31st Street Baptist Church, I'm pastor. At all times, I'm one guy. I am Joshua Mitchell, but different function based on where I am and what I'm doing. That's 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 one example I want to provide for you. For those that may be struggling with with this idea of one entity with different functions and different titles. The other was helpful for me growing up as a believer. This idea of homoousion and them being the same because they are of the same essence. They come from the same stuff. And the best way that I understand that and the best way I've explained that in my teaching has to do with this chemical compound of H2O. H2O is a chemical compound. But depending on where you find H2O, H2O is one chemical compound but shows up and manifests itself in three unique ways. You can have H2O in liquid form, right? There's H2O as liquid, but when it gets cold, H2O becomes ice and it's frozen. Still H2O, but given its environment, it shows up to us as ice. And when it gets too hot, that H2O becomes gas, flows into the atmosphere, right? All the same compound, all H2O, but manifesting itself in three different ways. And I think that if we understand God in this way, we can help get a grasp in an introductory way of this triune God. In Jesus' name, amen. As I've stated, we're going to go in the following weeks, we're going to talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, what makes them unique and do a deeper dive into how they function in our lives. But for now, I just want you to hear that, set the foundation from he, from Jesus Christ himself to set the foundation for our understanding of who God is according to the scriptures. Now you may be here tonight and you may not have ever heard about this triune God. You may have never heard of the salvific work of God the Son, Jesus Christ. I want to offer you tonight an opportunity to get to know God, to get in relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the Bible declares to us through the scriptures that we all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Sin being transgression or the going against, the will and the way of God. The Bible says that we all have done it. And that the price for that, the wages of sin is death. But we're going to learn in future weeks that we have a gift of God, the eternal life, through the salvific work of God the Son, Jesus Christ. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to do that today. You can type connect in the comment section. Or you can send us an email at info at 31sbc.org. You'll have the opportunity to connect with us in that way. So you, if you've never given your life to Christ, but you want to do that, or you don't have a church home, I want to invite you to get connected to our church, uh, to get connected to Christ and community. 31st Street Baptist Church is a great church. We have some great people trying to serve a great God, this great triune God. If you want to get connected to our church family, don't allow the separation of the season to stop you. You can push connect. You can type connect in the comment section or you can send us an email at info at 31sbc.org. And would you believe that brothers and sisters have already become a part of the 31st Street family since closing the physical doors of our sanctuary because of this opportunity to become a part of our family? So if that's what you desire to do, I want to invite you, my brother and sister, let us know in the comment section. Send us a message or send us an email so that we can get you connected to this family of faith. Family, I love you and I appreciate the ways that you continue to stay faithful and committed in your giving. Uh, let's continue to give God uh, our gifts, our tithes and our offerings. Those who can, I know that this is a season, a tight season, but I'm grateful for all those who have been able and have been consistent in your giving. And you can give in three ways. We continue to have the doors of our church open for drop off. For those that desire to drop off your gifts, um, we have a drive through, drive, drop off giving where you don't have to get out of your car, um, where we will receive the gifts from you Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. and on Sundays. 
from 11.30 to 12.30. We also invite you to send your contributions via the mail. You can do that by sending your contributions to 823 North 31st Street, Richmond, Virginia, and we will receive them. Or if you're like me, you give your tithes, your offerings through our mobile giving app. You can do that if you have a smartphone or a tablet or a device. You go to the App Store, download the GiveLify app. And you're able to set up a profile one time where you can give easily to 31st Street Baptist Church through that Give the Fire app. And I want to thank God for those of you who are taking advantage of that in this season. I love you. I'm so excited for us to be in Bible study tonight and to continue to set the firm foundation, the building blocks of our faith together. We'll see you on Sunday morning at 1030 via Facebook watch party. We have our worship watch party on our Facebook page. You can join us in that way or you can join us on YouTube where we have our YouTube premiere live of our worship experience. That is going to be at 10:30 on Sunday. We hope that you'll join us or on conference call on our new conference call number. You can get that information there. I love you family. I can't wait to be in worship with you on Sunday morning, but until then, may the Lord God bless you and keep you is my prayer. God bless you family.